Welcome to the South Valley Library edition of the Poets in the Library series. I am so pleased to introduce the two poets featured today here at the South Valley Library. One is the inaugural poet laureate of the state of New Mexico, and the other is an accomplished slam poet. I think between the two of them, you will see the depth and the breadth of South Valley's talent. South Valley is a unique part of Albuquerque. In fact, in my opinion, it's one of the most unique parts of any city in the United States of America. You hear the cranes? <laughs> it's wonderful. Anyway, so I just wanted to um, invite you to sit back, enjoy this feature, because I think it's going to be wonderful and show a really unique part of Albuquerque that has preserved the culture in a way that is really unparalleled. The first featured poet is Levi Romero. He was selected as the inaugural New Mexico Poet Laureate in 2020 and New Mexico's Centennial Poet in 2012. His most recent book is the co-edited anthology, Carencia, Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland. His two collections of poetry are A Poetry of Remembrance, New and Rejected Works, and In the Gathering of Silence. He is co-author of Sagrado, a photo poetics across the Chicano homeland. He is an assistant professor in the Chicana and Chicano Studies Department in, at the University of New Mexico. I have always felt that Levi's poetry is New Mexico. So it is my great honor to introduce Levi Romero. Rosendo used to ride the buses, scoring phone numbers from Rucas he'd meet at the parque or along Central's bus stops and diners. Three to five numbers a day, Holmes, he'd say. By the end of the week, I know I'll get lucky with at least one, eh? Maybe she'll have her own canton and I'll drop by with a bottle of wine and some good smoke y vámonos rezo, carnal. And he'd laugh, tilting his head back, taking a long drag from a camel regular. And then he'd look at me and laugh again and say something like, yes, te ato. Sometimes I just don't know about you, bro. Well, one night I was down at Jack's playing pool when the bartender yelled out that there was a phone call for someone whose name sounded kind of like mine. And I was real surprised that it was for me, you know. It was this fine babe from the west side that I'd met a few weeks before. She said my roommate had told her that I'd be at Jack's. She said she'd been wondering what I'd been doing and how come I hadn't called. She wanted me to go over. I said, hey, that sounds great, but I'd like to shoot a few more games of pool first. Not that I was really interested in pool anymore, but hey, I couldn't let on like I didn't ever get those kind of calls, you know? Not like those vatos down at Tito's Tavern with tattoos and dead aim stairs did leaning back against the wall, flirting with some ruka over the phone, laughing and teasing while the jukebox plays Sam Cooke, and me sitting there watching and wondering where I went wrong going right. I asked her if there's anything she'd like for me to bring over, some wine maybe, and she says, hey, that sounds cool, and could you bring some cigarettes too? So a little bit later on, there I am going down the street being all truchas for the jura because I didn't want nothing to ruin that movida, you know. Well, I pulled into the Casa Grande and asked for a bottle of Easy Nights and a pack of frajos. And I sat there looking through the drive-up window at the naked pinup girls on the wall. And I started thinking of home so far away and how oftentimes these days I had nowhere to go wishing I knew some nice girl I could drop by to visit and watch a mono with or just to sit and talk to. It was a rainy night, one of those beautiful burke rainy nights, and the streets were all black and wet, neon lights reflecting off of everything and running down the street in streams of color. And I thought of Rosendo, and I knew he was going to want to know everything. Orale, serio, chale, you're driving home. 
No es serio, Rosendo. Her name's Carmela. De veras, de veras. Ish, este vato. And then as I drove away, I looked in the rear view mirror and I started laughing because, hey, sometimes even I just don't know about you, bro. <laughs> Orale, saludes de la calle cuarta. South Ford spicy street overflowing with creamy joy and scornful sorrow. Resembling a faded watercolor painting rotting under the sun and growing tangled neath the billboard bosom size of a new frontier. I have felt you waking up sweating to the sounds of 3 a.m. trains rolling in on greasy tracks, spreading across your innocence like melting butter on a hot tortilla. Your gold-toothed mouth of prominence has gone silent under the weight of rusted steel and faded brick where cash registers once sang like Christmas chimes. On your black heel streets bleed tattooed backs in blue ink pennants for your soul, proud Puro Varela's 13. Your chapped, dusty sidewalks kissing the callous souls of homeless saints rising out of trash bins in the red-eyed dawn are fed by the black vein freeways dripping diseased America into your dirt alley dreams. Your complaints become rheumatoid groans of aching feet sliding across linoleum floors towards clock radios weeping Mexican ballads into the trumpet gold haze of memories too strong to stick or sink into the Rio Grande mud. Me amo Manuel Leiva, but they call me manual labor. Behind the suit screen windows and padlock doors of the Red Ball Cafe sit chrome and metal flake countertops frozen in the chewy silence of a Catholic Sunday ringing sad. A billion more still yearn to be served. And pickup trucks once danced into the Royal Fork restaurant parking lot from Gallup and Farmington slipping through the honeydew sweetness of ripening September. O oh, Earth Goddess, of asphalt and grime. Let me hear your hearty laugh flapping heavy like El Cambio storefront window ads that fill my salty visions with sweet roll promises crumbling unto the dry tongue of my worn out shoes. Thank you so much, Levi. Our next featured poet, Albuquerque native, Eva Marisol Crespin is a queer Chicana writer and slam poet who has been a part of numerous Albuquerque slam teams that have made it to a national final stage. She's twice published her premier publication, Morena, released in 2017, and a follow-up joint publication, Chicana Revolt with Mercedes Holtry. Please welcome Eva Marisol Crespin. Sometimes when you are brown, people assume things about you, make judgments before they know you. They speak to you in Spanish, split their tongues like they know more about you than you do. They try to tell you who you are like you would understand it better in a different language. Sometimes when you are brown, it is really easy to hate yourself, not because you hate yourself, not because you hate yourself, but because everyone is trying so hard not to hate you. Maybe if your skin could stop looking so burnt, stop acting so tan. Maybe if your mouth could stop sounding so oppressed, if your tongue could just stop spitting Spanglish, if you could speak a little more colonized and a lot less speak the truth. So sometimes you hate yourself because they tell you to. An open letter to the silent waiting area and the women at the MVD who told my grandmother to go back to Mexico and stop getting everyone sick. Sometimes we are bystanders, assign responsibility to someone else because it's easier to not have to claim your privilege, check your privilege. This poem is for everyone who watched a woman get verbally butchered and publicly degraded and found themselves speechless in the face of injustice. This isn't a TV show. There is no hidden camera waiting to praise you for doing the right thing. Sometimes you have to do the right thing because no one is watching. Sometimes you have to choose the side of the oppressed because one day it will be you. 
Imagine being cornered, everyone agreeing with your attackers, throwing stones with their eyes. We are headed toward a genocide, but no one wants to get involved. This poem is for the women who all of a sudden have the big mouths. This land is ours, and we have been waiting to take it back. This is a war, and we are coming for you. We are not too polite to break down the truth, to open up a history lesson for you. So tell me, who brought diseases to our land? Your ancestors did, and this is where I tell you to go back where you you came from. Get your own people sick. Take your oppression with you. Take your president with you. So sometimes when you are brown, you set people's bones just to break them again. You never make empty threats. This poem is a voice for my people, the ones who feel oppression settle in their systems like a flu. Like traitors who never leave, this poem is a voice for my grandmother who got told to go back to Mexico and got choked up before she could defend herself. So next time, you tell them that you were here first. You tell them if they want a bloodbath, a battle, a race war, a crusade, that they have started one and you will win because your ancestors are buried in the dirt. They are the roots, the trees, the air, the water. Your blood is sacred and it is fire. So sometimes when you are brown, it is really hard to be oppressed because you refuse, you resist, you put your feet in the ground, create an earthquake with your body, make a thunderstorm with your mouth, and refuse to be silenced. For the essential workers, survival is a beast. And we control the machines, work the respirators, care for your children, your grandparents, drive your trucks, ring your groceries, take your money, answer phones, do curbside pickup, and deliver it all right to you in the middle of a pandemic because this is America, home of the unacknowledged, underpaid, used, ignored, and we are the essential workers, lambs for the sacrifice, the control group for this illness, coronavirus, COVID-19, both names interchangeable for the overturning of our health, interchangeable with sacrifice, with ignorance, with people protesting to open the economy without er ever hearing the workers who run the front lines. Do you know what it's like to have no other option? If you think this country has your back, you're late to the party. This is America, where people protest keeping each other alive. Nurses spend days overwhelmed with COVID patients whose illness could have been preventable in the first place. My restaurant job wants me to serve takeout while wearing PPE not provided by the company, while hospital workers wear the same N95 masks for three weeks. So what does essential really mean? This country is drowning us with no hazard pay, no sick leave, half-truths about truths about how much danger we are really in. Our lives are not worth the honesty or the payout. We are only worth the risk. America is a disrupted burial ground, and all these workers are the ghosts who still show up to their jobs every day because no one has let them know that they have a choice, that survival is an option. We do not demand equality. We are not equal in this crisis. We demand fairness, demand our right to be heard, compensated, protected. We demand a better life for our families. At any given moment, we could contract this virus, and we will be just another body count. Stay home or you could be next and that's not a threat, it's a fact. Illness doesn't discriminate and you are not immune. Privilege means that you won't hear us because you think this pandemic doesn't apply to you. And the truth is, it just hasn't affected you yet. This is a list of demands. We have built this country on our backs and we are still carrying it. Survival is a beast. Our lives are not expendable. We are not interchangeable. We are not afraid to ask for what we deserve. And if we decide we can shut this machine down, we do not belong to the government. We belong to ourselves, to our families. And this time, there is no other option. We will be heard. This one's a funny one. My great-grandfather was a united farm worker. He fought alongside Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And when he was honored for his work years later, he gave a speech that no one was prepared for. He said, I would like to thank President Barama for all of his hard work. I would also like to say that I think Dolores Huerta should be on top of Cesar Chavez. Thank you. You see, my grandpa never thinks before he speaks. 
No, Grandpa, you're 5'5". Five, five. There's no way you could have ever been 6'2". I don't care how fat you say you got. He says, but Hita, that's the truth. Ask your grandma. And when I do, she calls him a liar. At 86 years old, he's seen it all, done it all, and heard it all, but he just can't remember it all. Especially not the bad days. You see, my grandpa never has bad days. He says it's because they're only for gringos. That was until the day he heard his wife call from La Cocina. There's no tortillas. There's only bread. Because in my family, we love tortillas. Without tortillas, there would be no burritos. And growing up, we knew if you don't eat your burritos, Jesus will kill you. Thank you, Eva. And now, a member of the library staff here at the South Valley Library, Mark Maravetz. He also does children's programming. Please welcome Mark. This building at 3904 Isleta Southwest is the fourth incarnation of a library in the South Valley. The first one was run by volunteers. It was started in 1958 and was referred to as both the Southwest Community Center Library and the Southwest Valley Library. It was located on Sunflower Road. The library had a collection of 3,000 books, many of which were donations from the community. Even then we had a story time. However, hours were very limited, being open only seven hours a week. There was also a summer reading program, although it was available only to children eight to 10 years old. This library serviced a community of about 30,000. The part-time librarian was paid $10 a week. By 1961, we had our second incarnation. We had moved to Ari Nal. This library was larger and even had a meeting room. We were still taking donations and had gotten the collection up to 6,000 books. In 1965, the library was certified by the state of New Mexico, making it eligible for state funding. We had also increased to 23 hours a week. The summer reading program expanded to five to 13 year olds. The library was still mainly run by volunteers, having only one paid librarian who earned $30 a week. In 1974, we moved into our third incarnation. A new building was built on community center land where the old county health satellite building had burned down. The library offered story hours, puppet shows, and field trips for school children. We also started a joint venture with the city of Albuquerque where materials were shared. The library also established a South Valley historical collection, much of which we still have. The collection grew to 12,000 materials in the 2400 square foot building, Mrs. Ruth Sims, librarian for about 25 years, retired in 1982. In 1990, we reached the fourth and latest incarnation with our current location. This building was brand new, designed by Jorge de la Torre in what is known as the New Mexico vernacular style. The library won several architectural awards, including an award from the New Mexico Business Journal, one from the State General Contractors Association, and one from the Albuquerque Conservation Association. It has 14,300 square feet, with hours now being 40 a week. The library has two study rooms, a program room, and a large children's area with seating nooks. The library was also lucky enough to have Mary Higgins as children's librarian for 17 years to help get things going. She retired in 2007. The collection now consists of 37,000 items. This includes a reference, the South Valley Historical Collection, adult and children's fiction and nonfiction books, DVDs, magazines, audiobooks, and music. The library also has a very large Spanish selection as well as some other languages. Free public computers are available. We also have ukuleles available for checkout. Materials can also be requested from the other branches in the system. Normally, the library offers many different programs covering all ages, and summer reading is now open to all ages. And every October, the library works with the Kukui Association for the annual Kukui Burning. 
past winner's models are displayed at the library in a special cabinet. Thank you. Hope to see you soon at the South Valley Library. And now we're bringing it inside with the community poets. These are all poets who live in the neighborhood surrounding the South Valley Library. We're starting with Felicia Caton Garcia. She lives, writes, gardens, teaches college in the South Valley. Felicia's poetry and fiction have been featured in the Indiana Review, Prairie Schooner, Blue Mesa Re Review, and Plume. Her collection of poetry, Say That, was published by the University of New Mexico Press. Felicia teaches American Studies, Chicanx Studies, Creative Writing, and English at Central New Mexico Community College. Please welcome Felicia Caton Garcia. Thank you very much, Mary. The poem that I'm going to read today is an elegy for my cousin who passed away earlier this summer. It's a bit of a work in progress. Elegy for John. One, listening to my dog's dream is probably my favorite thing. It's the last thing you wrote to me or anyone. I smiled to read it. I wanted to reply, but I was afraid you would call me and I would have to decide to answer. Answering meant hours listening to you stumble down sidewalks, vomit in alleys, love and fight me, intelligible and not in turns. It ruins me, I told my friends and family, selfishly thinking of you in ruins, a scaffold of empty bottles glinting under streetlights. Not answering meant wrapping guilt around my shoulders like a pelt. I didn't answer how I read your words at all. Two, unbearable, the way we all wanted to save you, the way we offered our homes, our money, our best intentions, so much expectation, so many roads to hell, but how we wanted you to walk just once down that road. We had nothing you could use. Three, tell me, is there any fairy tale that couldn't be undone by the presence of a dog? A dog like the one who sits beside me when I can't stand, wolf muzzle and white teeth, the one who sleeps in the snow if I let him. Imagine his thick ruff clutched in the hand of Little Red. Imagine his nails clicking across the stone palace floors toward the godmother with hate in her heart. Hear him howl to keep the children to the path. Smell the rending flesh of the huntsman before he steps too far into the forest. Four. Your dogs must have known you were dying. They must have smelled your lungs and liver, the blood you vomited into empty glasses surrounding your bed. And when you seized the last time, feet and fists knocking aside everything, you were not alone and they stayed until we found you. I'm trying to imagine what it was like for them to lie beside your cooling body. Five, I think by the end, their love was the only love you could endure unquestioning, uncomplicated, relentless. They didn't even mind the fleas you must have shared with them in the basement you died in. Fleas, after all, being one of the things that happen in the life of a dog. Not a human failing, but expected, like hunger and rabbits and dusk. Six, tell me that heaven is a pack of dogs running through fields. Tell me that your two human legs flash in the model of fur. Tell me you lie down in the communal pile at night, tongue, tooth, and tail. Tell me your dream is the sound of dogs dreaming. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. The next poet is Marcial Delgado. He is the host and organizer for Voices of the Barrio Open Mic Poetry at El Chante, Casa de Cultura in the heart of downtown Albuquerque. Marcial's first collection of poems, Sell Me Insanity, was released in 2019. Marcial Delgado says he is just a vato from the barrio who fell in love with writing and poetry. Please welcome Marcial Delgado. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm gonna read a poem about the South Valley called South Valley. I love the South Valley because when the sun goes down and the autumn leaves bury the roads with summertime memories, the limbs of trees seem to serenade the fresh night sky with subtle swathes of enchanted embrace. 
the side of motion, delights the eye, and mystifies the mind with the cloud of imagination, ready to release the stories and poetry of these Southwest streets. I love the South Valley because in the crisp of the valley morning air, the roosters cock a doodle their dues, reminding the world of the work that needs to be done. The small house sparrow sings its beautiful song of enlightenment, which sets the early tone to peace and tranquility. The morning dove dances in the cool, cool breeze on top of power line 20 feet high in the sky to the sweet melody of the sparrow. The sounds of life and the sounds of faith resonate through this Valle de Sur. I love the South Valley because on any given Sunday, you can see lowriders and bombas, Monte Carlos and Al Caminos, Rivieras and 64 Chevys just cruising West Valle Street while bumping the sound of Nuevo Mexico like Tiny Murray, Roberto Griego, or even those East Side stories. Like banners and flags screaming, si se puede, or viva la raza, our culture thrives and our culture survives with the roots of cottonwood trees, just like the roots of our families. Whether old or new, we belong to this heritage and community. I love the South Valley because no matter where I am, I can always get my hands around a big, fat, greasy barbacoa burrito con cebolla y cilantro. I love the South Valley because that's where I told her for the first time what was really on my mind. Beneath the Caremore chiropractic sign on the corner of Bridge and Golf, I held her hand, kissed her lips, looked deep in her eyes, and I told her that I'm falling in love. Eight years later, we got married and had our party in her mother's backyard, just right down the road from there, dancing in the cool September breeze underneath the, fight, the valley starlight of our passionate hearts with family and friends. And that's why I love the South Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Marcial. Next reader is Jacqueline Murray Loring. Jacqueline Murray Loring is an author and poet who lives in the South Valley. She won the Dira Press Irish International Chapbook Poetry Prize in 2012 for her collection, The History of Bearing Children. In 2019, she wrote Chemo Theater, Fact and Folklore, as well as Vietnam Veterans Unbroken, Conversations on Trauma and Resiliency. In 2020, she was the poetry curator for the Sense of Wonder Experiences Art and Poetry Reveal. Please welcome Jacqueline Murray Loring. Thank you, Mary. The first poem, all of these poems are from my book, The History of Bearing Children. The first one is called The Order of Things. With head bowed, cheeks still pink from my mother's words and warnings, my father nods agreement adjusts my veil and flowers, walks me down the papered aisle, joins our hands, gives me to you. As we take our vows, I remember my cousin, sister Catherine, who prepared us kids for communion, removed thorns and made us a crown of backyard apple blossoms to wear when we carried Mary to her holy feast. Before Sister Catherine married Jesus, with veiled eyes, she gave away her name. In that long black gown, beads that dragged her steps, she taught us girls about sacrifices, preached about serving our master, chastity, and the rights of men on earth. At six, I learned my place in the order of things. The second poem is called The Edge. This was written on Cape Cod. In between their yelling, the boys wrestle, bury each other in the warm Cape Cod sand that irritates my eyes, that sours my disposition. At the edge of breaking waves, our daughter's attempt at swimming lessons, our other curly head toddles, bravely splashes you as you nap. And the last poem is called Scars. I said, I already stopped, brought storm door glass and bandages. Yes, 
the baby's fine. The bleeding's better. The cuts will heal, the doctor said, warned the boys not to chase her. I washed the rug. I dried the tears, fed them all, lullabied them to sleep. I did call, waited on hold till the screams drove me to others for help. The baby's fine, the boys too. The cuts will heal, but scar. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Next reader is Gabino Noriega. Gabino Noriega is an Albuquerque native, PhD candidate, educator, and artist. He is also a family man focused on connecting his family to the earth and traditions of our ancestors. He has performed as a musician and poet in various events locally and regionally. Please welcome Gabino Noriega. Oh, just like everybody else, thank you all for having me and for, um, you know, giving the opportunity to be in such uh, contact with wonderful, amazing uh, artists. So the poem I'm going to read for you today is called Mi Familia. Mi Familia, let the words flow from your lips like an arrow through the air directed at some beast who picked the wrong warrior to mess with. Mi Familia. The drums pounding in mi corazón filled with the stories of my ancestors and their journey to get me where I am today. Mi familia, the pain of parting ways and shifting worlds and oceans apart, but still being a part of something worth living for. Sitting in my nanita's kitchen, waiting for her magical arroz con leche, hearing her share her stories, her knowledge picking up her dreams and the dreams of her children as her eyes close like in a detached slumber, waiting to float away like una nube. Watching mi madre and mi padre work their you-know-what off to make the dreams of mi familia reality by fighting wars not only with guns, but also with the color of their skin. Hearing of fallen hermanos and per primos, tios, abuelos, amigos, just so I can understand why I'm important why I matter and why I need to be proud. And now here I sit watching my children grow from babies to teens, thinking about all those same dreams. Only this time I have my eyes closed, waiting to float away like una nube. My heart pounds with that same beat that pounded in the chest of mi familia. And I feel their cuentos in my blood, hoping that my children feel it too. Por qué? Because mi familia is my power, my driving force the battery that fills my life force and the guidance star lead my jornada. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gabino. The next poet is Priscilla Baca y Candelaria. Priscilla is a native of Atrisco. She is the keeper of her matriarchal home where she tends to the land, goats and fowl. She has shared poetry from New York to San Francisco, has been published in several anthologies, and cut two CDs with Christian Orellana. Please welcome Priscilla Baca y Candelaria. Thank you for having me. I have a couple of poems that I'd like to share with you. The Beast. The beast runs through our land wearing his golden cloak, devouring native flesh, flaunting his power, torturing his victims, born again, still with cloven hooves. He prances in prestige on the bones of honesty. In God we trust, self-proclaimed savior of the world, picking the meat off the bones of his enemies, using our young to do his deed. Torquemada. Hitler, Stalin, Bush, Trump. Remember their names, each era has its beast. One walks amongst us for God, oil, and country, shaking the earth with his greed, casual at the last count led to slaughter. Democracy, believe as I lie, trust as I steal, love as I may. Rich man's truce, feed the beast, feed him your sons and daughters, thank him, bow down or martial law will be enforced. Cower at his wealth, it bought him the throne. Look to the east, see the power of the beast, he does his deeds in your name. He represents, depicts America. 
So long as we are silent, his thunder muffles the wails, muffles with weapons of mass destruction, weapons that have only been found in his home. Come, have a whiskey, sit and watch the slaughter. A toast America, born again is he, born in the land of the free. Play that fiddle, watch it burn. Cloven hooved is he, born again in the land of the free. Mama's kitchen, sustenance, food, ven a comer, nourishment, strong spiritual healers have graced the portals of my existence. Bolio clicking, dough is spread. Lessons taught, militance begins in the kitchen. Women, mujeres, siempre con su lumbre calentando algo. Always cooking, tantalizing aroma, chile, soul food. Women of the valley making her children strong. If you feed them, they will come. Nourishing body and soul con cuentos y un frijol. Abuelitas bizcochitos, delicacies melt in your mouth. As you and mine's eye hear her words, ancient's grace every corner, every crevice of your being. Child danced across the kitchen floor. Ah, ah! Militants born in mama's kitchen. Revolucion to the rat tat 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 of a rolling pin. From the la reina a la malinche, hija, madre, la guadalupana, leaders, caretakers of our most precious jewel, la plebe. Those who stray from the kitchen never leave hungry. The only picket line is the tear in the tortilla, sending all who come with happy heart, full belly, panza llena, corazón contento. I am the keeper of the flame. Militants started in the kitchen long before me. I stoke the fire of revolucion through who I am. Soy Chicana, bolillo clicking. Oh, thank you, Priscilla. You never disappoint. <laughs> the next reader is Richard Wolfson. Richard Wolfson has been published in Central Avenue, Malpais Review, and other poetry journals, and has given public readings for 15 years. He mainly does poetry, art, hybrid collaborations of books and wall art pieces with his wife, Vicki Bolin, displayed in her Albuquerque studio and in art shows. Please welcome Richard Wolfson. Okay, thank you, Mary. Thank you, poets. This is perfect spacing. Priscilla, Esme Vecino, De Ciento Metros, De Mi Casa. Okay, so this is inauguration week, and we all heard a great inauguration poem. So this is my inauguration poem from 11 years ago. Today, January 20th, 2009, the Black River of the Forlorn rejoices. The bluestone inner dream of a bell reverberates. The cobblestone of desire clenches chimney-like. Children undress the zeal of a howitzer. Tears count backward the memories of Antigone. The dance of crows mesmerizes billboard lives. Hatless countries mount the hill of no return. Clocks look through the mirror of retinal apartheid. Grievances of the past tickle like convergent lines. Air ducts contract like fingers of cardiac arrest. The brow of the unknowable wakes like an attentive bullhorn. And somewhere a thin man awakes, a small idea on his lips like a railroad where the porters draw patterns on the invisible. And we all smell the strange fruit of reinvention. Second adjacent poem to the first one. This one's called Ode to W.E.B. Du Bois. Sons of night who darkly plod against the stone, against the blue streak, born the seventh sun with tail and veil. We lived the great blue 
and wandering shadow. In the first few seconds after emancipation, our glimmer, freshly minted, devoured the past, roasted sorrow into memory, split the blues into two parts. Wagon trains watering courage like honeydew, forsaken by the fiercely sunny. Women who carried morsels of water in sunken sockets, circumscribed by blue moonbeams of the holy. Thank you, South Valley poets. Thank you, Richard. And now we move on to our next poet, Mary Dudley. Mary Dudley has lived, worked, and written poetry in the South Valley for more than 50 years. Her work has been published in Poets Speak and Fixed and Free anthologies, as well as other collections, including Value, Missing Persons, 22 Poems and a Prayer for El Paso, and Civilization in Crisis, an anthology of poetic response. Recently, she published a small chapbook of quiet poems, Be Still. Please welcome Mary Dudley. Hi. This is such a great event and I'm really grateful to be included. The first poem that I'm going to read today is written about the open space field that's right across the street from Rio Grande Valley, it's very, uh, Rio Grande High School. It's called Bailing Alfalfa on a Hot Day. Three cattle egrets of flight in the hot June light follow the farmer who is bailing his alfalfa. His tractor turns up bird feed as it churns its way across the field. White flags waving along his machine, those birds dip into the new cut crop, snatching grasshoppers and worms, crickets, frogs, and flies swarm, a feast stirred from earthy slumber. This field's been the insects feast until today, and then the tables turned, and they became the prey. The egrets dance with death themselves. One slip and the baler's blades will slice them, dice their classic necks, shred their elegant wings. Still they dive and dart, weaving the tractor's path on wing. And the farmer steers his lumbering machine and calculates the price this crop might bring. Second poem, is uh, from the same field, really. It's the view across the field, the open space up to the Sandias in the early spring. It's called Rio Grande Spring. Spring comes to the valley, the new lace of elm leaves, sweet green against gray silk, the sky a dome of embossed brocade, heavy with new thunder. Clouds puff over the alfalfa, pushing fields to green. The mountains slumber, many layers of deep blue shadow under a dusting of spring snow. And Monday will be my husband's 79th birthday. And this poem is written about this time in our lives. It's called The Gift of Time. It's in my new book, Be Still. The gift of time. These feel like extra years after the flush of love that's new, after the promises broken or kept, after the births and the career pursuits, after the farewells to all that, we still have time. We gather seeds from this harvest for the next. We put up peaches for a winter morning's toast. We put in bulbs again, believing in another spring. We plant a tree. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary. Now we have uh, another poet, Alfredo Quiroz. Alfredo uh, Quiroz is a Mexican-American poet and Renaissance man of many talents. He has a poem in Eloquence 2015 Poetry Collection published by the American Library of Poetry. A multiple award winner in local poetry slams during his teen years, 
Since graduating from UNM, Kiros is a youth mentor who wants to create opportunities for youth to cultivate and explore their creativity. Please welcome Alfredo Kiros. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> this next poem or this poem is called Him. I often have conversations with myself that end with me having the last word. <clears throat> My consciousness doesn't live in this waking life, but damn, does it hurt when it starts speaking at night. I call this other voice in my head by the name of him. He says hurtful things sometimes and is the explosion when overthinking walks into the room. Sometimes it's myself overthinking and him at the same exact time in a secluded place he likes to call the mind. I usually start the meetings. We've been reuniting in this place for a long time now. We meet from 12 to 4 a.m. seven days a week and have an occasional formal get together once a month. In this place, we share how our day was. The way I start the meeting is by asking the question, how was your day? Now, those are the only words I have until the end of the meeting because overthinking and him always seem to take over. Those meetings never help. I remember one day I stood up and asked them, why don't you guys leave? And the response was me waking up to another day trying to chase a dream. <laughs> we stopped meeting for a while. When overthinking and him had worked too hard and it was just that place and him with a grin, but never a smile. Last night, I started that meeting with those four words, but it felt like not one of them were breathing. And I was behind closed doors. It was 2 a.m. and overthinking was running late, but still in that corner was him building up hate. When overthinking knocked on the door, it was he who answered and told him it was time for overthinking to go. Now close your eyes and imagine it. Myself and him trapped in a closed environment with hate in his eyes and rage in mine. I knew I was ready to handle it. I stood up and met his eyes in the most perfect parallel lines. And then he started blurting out words that weren't very nice. So then I snapped and he met my fist punching through his gut, enabling him to feel it in his spine. I kicked, punched, rattled and dragged him around. I told him not to mess with the young man, a little too old to be playing around. It tossed, turned, squirmed, and moaned. I was his nightmare coming true in the place he thought he owned. I kicked him out and let the built of fire burn. Then overthinking came in and said it was his turn. I threw overthinking into my fire and watched it turn to ash. <laughs> now open your eyes and look at me. You couldn't know I was fighting myself and neither could I, but I'm a mind with potholes and a little amount of time. So now you can see what kind of wars are being fought in this young man's eyes. And every day I face this, but see, it gets better when tamed. I'm myself blacking out he who shall not be named. I will win every time as long as I'm in control. And you will tremble in fear when I'm the only thing left for you to hold. Cause you will remember me singing my lovely hymn. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Our next poet is Felix Peralta. Felix Peralta finds lots of inspiration from the history of New Mexico and from his apprenticeship with Jimmy Santiago Baca. He was born and raised in the South Valley of Albuquerque. He is also a national touring musician. Please welcome Felix Peralta. Comanche Highway passing through the canyon. Comanche spirit, mother earth and companion. Captured by the unknown, now I'm a landless penny's idol. Blood and pain terrorize the desert land. Servants sold, I just can't understand. Like a pelt of buffalo, I'm a landless penny's idol. Once a warrior, on the Eastern Plains I ride, enslaved by the Spaniard clan, learned to love Jesus Christ. Our religion was the buffalo. I'm a landless henizado. Camanchera, Coyote de Apache. Two religions fighting within me. Like a pelt of buffalo, I'm a landless henizado. Our religion was the buffalo. I'm a landless Henny Zotto. Thank you. 
Thank you, Felix. Well, I hope you enjoyed all this great variety of voices from the South Valley. As I said at the beginning, you could see from the featured poets through to the community poets that we have such a breadth and depth of talent in Albuquerque South Valley. And the culture stays, stays pure and continues. And uh, through the kitchens, as Priscilla said, and through the fields and through the families, and it's just wonderful. So I appreciate everyone who read today. Thank you so much. And if you would like to read at your local library here in Albuquerque, please send me an email at Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program at gmail.com. That's Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program at gmail.com. Do tell your friends and thank you so much for watching. I'm sure you enjoyed it as much as I did.